Good evening. So good evening and welcome to the next installment of the Slack Public Lectures. Um, I'm really glad you're here tonight to help us turn it up. I'm really glad you're here tonight to help us celebrate the 10th anniversary of the launching of the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Actually, um, this is a week when those of us at Slack are not maybe so much in the mood for celebrating. Um, you probably saw in the paper that our second director, Burton Richter, passed away last week. Uh, Bert was one of the, really one of the great scientists of the 20th century. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for leading the team that discovered a new set of elementary particles called the psi particles. Actually, his contribution to that experiment was really exceptional. He designed the accelerator, he designed the detector, both of them extremely innovative designs that basically were copied in more or less the rest of the history of particle physics. And he put that team in exactly the right place to make this great discovery, which also uh, reshaped the landscape of particle physics. After that, he became the director of the laboratory. And maybe one of the important achievements of his term as directorship was the idea which he promoted that Slack should go to space. And so um, we became the host of one of the two instruments on this Fermi satellite, um, the Large Aperture Space Telescope. And the two instruments have been now been floating up there for 10 years, uh, doing all kinds of amazing observations of the universe. So today we have Eric Charles, uh, one of the project scientists on this mission, and one of the people really most responsible for making the Fermi instrument um, actually an even more precise telescope now than when it was launched. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Eric, and he can tell you what's been happening in the last 10 years as we've been exploring the high energy physics of the universe. Here he is. Uh, thank you, Michael. Mic on? Uh, first of all, can people hear me? Is the mic on here? OK, great. So um, welcome to Slack, everybody. And um, as Michael said, my name's Eric Charles. And I'm going to be telling you, um, well, about the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. But to do that properly, I'm going to be telling you about a number of other things, um, including gamma rays. And, and why would we would want to have a gamma ray telescope at all? Um, so just uh, I'm go ahead and get started. Um, so an outline of my talk, I'm going to spend about two or three minutes, maybe five minutes, telling you about myself at the, at the beginning of the talk. Um, and then uh, I'm going to spend about the first half of the talk talking about uh, why we would do gamma ray astronomy, how we would do gamma ray astronomy, um, and uh, you know, how we actually see gamma rays, and what sort of things we can see um, when, we, when we see in gamma rays. And then um, the second half of the talk, uh, what I'm going to do is Basically, I'm going to show you a lot of animations that uh, NASA has put together to really focus on the science highlights of the Fermi telescope. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some very nearby objects that you're probably very familiar with that actually surprisingly give off a lot of gamma rays. And I'm going to move further, further away to more exotic objects, more, more distant objects. Um, and during, while I'm doing that, I'm going to be showing a lot of videos because uh, NASA has an amazing animation studio, sort of science visualization studio. And they, they really help to, to get the point across. Um, OK, so I'm going to say just a little bit about myself. Um, I guess the first thing that I should say is that I've never actually taken an astronomy class in my life. Um, and hopefully, I can explain to you why that's OK, and I'm still up here, and I actually know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, I was born in France in, in the 1970s, and I, I grew up in New Mexico. And um, I was actually a pretty terrible student. Uh, I ended up uh, going to the Midwest for college. And um, I didn't actually get into graduate school. Um, but the University of Wisconsin was really nice about not letting me into graduate school. So what I did is I actually um, moved to um, Madison, Wisconsin, got a job as a lab technician, and uh, started taking graduate school classes. 
And after a little while, uh, they realized I was doing fine in the classes and that I obviously really wanted to be a scientist. So they, they let me be a, grad, a graduate student. So I did a PhD in particle physics at the University of Wisconsin and had the opportunity to go to Geneva, Switzerland, to CERN, where the big particle accelerator is, and then to uh, come to the Bay Area. Um, I was supposed to be in the Bay Area for six months, but that was over 20 years ago. Um, I worked on a, a project called Babar that was actually based here at SLAC while I was a graduate student. And then I loved uh, you know, living in the Bay Area, so I got a postdoc at Berkeley. And then uh, in 2005, my old office mate from Berkeley I would come down to Slack to work, said, hey, look, we're working on this new kind of telescope. It's a telescope that sees gamma rays, and asked me if I'd be interested in working on it. And for me, it was just absolutely a no-brainer. And the reason it was a no-brainer, um, and I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about this in the talk later, is that it was a new kind of telescope. And every time we've looked at the sky in a new way, we've gotten a huge number of surprises, just because there's so many things out there that we just don't know about yet. So scientifically, the idea of working on, on a new kind of telescope was just incredibly appealing to me. Um, so that's how I came to be here. I came to SLAC in 2005, which was three years before Fermi launched, and I've been working on Fermi primarily since then. Um, just a little bit more about myself. I have a couple of hobbies. Um, one of them is to build art cars, and the other is to do pyrotechnics. Um, when we were organizing this talk, people were trying to make the analogy between some of the fireworks that we see with Fermi and some of the things that I do. Um, I don't think it's a very good analogy, honestly, <laughs> because the sort of things that we see with Fermi are much, much more dramatic than this. <laughs> so moving right along. Um, so first, I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you about gamma rays to really sort of set the stage. Um, I'm sure you all know a little bit about gamma rays, but I, I really want to give you a sense of um, what a gamma ray is, how hard it is to make them, and what we can learn by, by looking at them. So I guess the first thing is, uh, you know, gamma rays are a kind of electromagnetic radiation, like many other things, like visible light, like radio waves, like microwaves. And the only difference between these various kinds of, of um, electromagnetic radiation is the frequency of the radiation or the wavelength of the radiation, depending on how you look at it. Um, some kinds of radiation, like radio waves, can have very long wavelengths. Uh, we're talking about, you know, over here, you know, maybe hundreds of meters. I mean, the, a single wave can be the length of a football field or more. Um, on the far end, on gamma rays, the wavelength is much, much shorter. Oftentimes, it's about the size of the nucleus of an atom. So, you know, a, a millionth of a billionth of, uh, of a meter. And um, these longer wavelengths, basically, they're not oscillating. They're not wiggling as, as quickly. And so they don't carry as much energy. So radio waves carry relatively little energy, whereas gamma rays just carry a tremendous amount of energy because they're wiggling back and forth so quickly. Now, when I came to SLAC to work on the Fermi telescope, I really did not know anything about astronomy. I'd never taken an astronomy class in my life. And the first thing that somebody told me is, astronomers really like to look at things in as many different ways as possible. And that's something that's really stuck with me um, ever since then. And I'm going to give you a little illustration of this. Um, this is an image that you're actually very familiar with, but I've only taken the blue from the image. Um, so you might, some of you might recognize the image right now, but you're probably sort of wondering um, what this might be. And here's the red from the same image. And by this point, I, I, you know, some of you probably, probably know what's going on. Um, here's the black from, from that same image. And I really want to make the point that if you only see the room in one color, you're getting a very jaded view of the room. You're, you're missing out on a lot of things. And this is, of course, what happens when you put all those colors together. You get you know, an iconic image that's immediately recognizable. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the same thing, but with actually an astrophysical and astronomical um, object, um, one that hopefully everybody's familiar with, um, the Milky Way, the galaxy that, that we actually live in. Um, so just to remind everybody, the Milky Way, the galaxy we live in, is a big, flat disk. And inside that disk, it's got a couple of spiral arms. Now, we live inside the disk. Um, the disk is something like 50,000 light years across, and it's a few hundred light years thick. So when you see the disk in the night sky, what it looks like is it looks like a band. When you're looking right along the disk, you see all of these extra stars. But if you're looking in other directions away from the disk, you only see the nearby stars. Um, I was actually in Peru last week uh, on vacation, and I learned something very interesting, which is that the Incas um, actually called these dark spots here in the Milky Way constellations. And they would do things like find a puma here or a llama or something like that just because they're at high altitude. And to them, the Milky Way is very, very bright. And so they actually would find patterns inside the dark spots in the Milky Way. 
And I'm gonna say a little bit more about this, but um, just to give you a sense of what astronomers really care about, here's a beautiful poster that um, a colleague of mine put together many years ago, which is that same slice of the sky, that same little band that makes up the Milky Way, um, in 10 different wavelengths, going from very low energy radio to very, very high energy gamma ray. Um, ignore the colors, those are just false colors, but you can see that there's patterns there that are very different in the different wavelengths. And you can learn a tremendous amount by comparing um, those different patterns. And I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of that in the next few minutes. Um, so the first thing is if you look at the night sky just with your eyes, what you see is the Milky Way here. And you notice right away that there's some bright patches and there's some dark patches, the same dark patches that the Inca you know, found, found constellations in. Um, and you, know, you might ask yourself, are those dark patches because something's blocking the light? Or are they dark patches just because there's, there's, there's no stars there? Now, if you look in a slightly longer wavelength, so slightly lower energy light, what you see is you don't see those dark patches anymore. You just see this bright um, sort of pattern of stars. And when you see this, it becomes really apparent that we live inside a disk of stars. And it also becomes apparent that you know, there's one direction in the disk that's brighter than the other directions, and that's the direction towards the center of the galaxy. You can't really make that out quite so well in optical because there's a lot of stuff, there are a lot of clouds that are blocking um, that particular direction. Now, as you go to um, even longer wavelengths, so even lower energy light, um, in the mid-infrared, actually what happens is the clouds that are blocking the optical light, those clouds are shining because they've been heated up by the optical light, and then they're re-emitting that light in the, in the mid-infrared. And so you can actually see this great anti-correlation between the mid-infrared image and the optical image. The things that are really bright, there's some structures that are really bright in the infrared that are actually dark in the optical because you know, the, light is being, the optical light's being absorbed and it's being re-emitted in the infrared. As you go to even longer wavelengths, um, you get to a particular wavelength where hydrogen molecules emit a lot of light. And what this allows you to do, it allows you to trace out where the hydrogen lives in our galaxy. And it actually turns out that you can see a lot of correlation between some of these, these clouds that are shining and the places where the hydrogen lives. So you start to figure out that the clouds are, are largely made of, of hydrogen molecules. And then when you go all the way down to radio, you can actually find wavelengths where the hydrogen atoms emit, not the molecules, but the actual atoms. And by comparing these two images, you can learn about the chemistry of the galaxy. You can learn about places where the hydrogen atoms have formed into molecules and places where they haven't yet because of the, of the local environment. So anyway, um, I didn't say anything about gamma rays there, but I just really wanted to illustrate for you the point that by looking at the sky in so many different ways, you learn much more than you would ever learn if you only looked in, in one wavelength. So this is why astronomers try and have as many friends as possible, so they always have somebody who has data that can teach them something new, new about the sky when they compare it to their own data. Um, so now, to sort of set the stage for gamma rays, I'm gonna do it by way of comparison. I'm gonna tell you a few things about visible light, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show how these things are very different for gamma rays. And in order to do this, I'm gonna ask a question, which is how did we evolve to become sensitive to visible light? Why do we see the wavelengths that we see? And I think that there's kind of three answers to this question, and I think they're very interesting answers. Um, the first answer is that's where the sun puts out the most of its energy. This is a graph of uh, wavelength against basically the amount of energy the sun's putting out. And you can see that the peak lies right in the middle of the visible band. So if you're an animal living on Earth, then it's really efficient to see invisible because that's where all the energy is bouncing around. So you can have relatively small eyes and you can still see things um, that are nearby. Now a second answer is because our atmosphere is actually transparent at those wavelengths. This is a graph of wavelength against the fraction of the light that makes it through the atmosphere to the ground. And you see that there's this nice window right in the visible band. And that allows you to see things that are very far away. Um, if you tried to move outside of that window, uh, the world would appear very foggy to you because things in the air would absorb the light and you wouldn't be able to see very far. And so everything would, would, would be very foggy. So again, this is a second reason that our eyes evolved to see these particular wavelengths. The third reason is a little bit different. Um, this reason is basically that the energy um, carried by light at those wavelengths is just about the right amount of energy to affect a molecular bond. And this is part of the vision process here. I, I'm not gonna go into this at all because, uh, well, I just make a fool of myself. 
But um, the point is that a single photon of light can come in and it can affect a molecular bond in a way that can basically generate a chemical signal that your brain can then process and that can make the whole, basically, um, the whole vision process. Um, so to recap and to sort of put this in terms of numbers, uh, the surface of the sun, the part we see, is about 5,000 degrees Celsius. Um, yellow sunlight has a wavelength of about half a millionth of a meter. Um, by way of comparison, a cell might be 10 to 30 millionths of a meter across. So it's, it's smaller than a cell. That's why you can see cells under a microscope. And one photon of yellow light has 2.1 electron volts of energy. That means if you had a 2.1 volt battery and you took an electron and used it to accelerate that electron, um, you'd get about just enough energy to make a photon of yellow light. So now I'm finally going to start talking about gamma rays. By way of comparison, in order to make the sort of typical gamma rays that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the evening, uh, the temperature of a star or an object would have to be about 2 trillion degrees Celsius. Um, the wavelength is about a million billionth of a meter, so it's about the size of a nucleus. And one photon, one gamma ray, when it comes in, it's not just going to change a molecular bond. It's going to splatter all the atoms of the molecule over the place, and it's going to destroy thousands of nearby molecules because it has so much energy. That's why gamma rays are, ha are hazardous, because they really they disrupt a lot of molecules in a, in a very, very small, small area. Um, so the point here is that a star would have to be 2 trillion degrees Celsius in order to make a lot of gamma rays. And anything that's that hot is basically in the process of blowing itself apart. It's not just going to sit there and happily burn. It's going to catastrophically destroy itself. So the question then is, is how do we make, make gamma rays? And to reiterate this point, um, this is a graph that shows how different temperature stars are different colors. So a very hot star, about 15,000 degrees, um, is a blue star. Whereas a very cool star down here, about 3,000 degrees, would be very red. And our sun is, is somewhere in between. But remember, for gamma rays, I'm talking about trillions of degrees Celsius. None of these stars are anywhere near hot enough to give off gamma rays just because they're, they're glowing. Um, in fact, there's not really anything in the universe that's hot enough to give off gamma rays just because it's, it's glowing. Um, you know, our sun's kind of in the middle of the sort of spectrum of objects that are out there. There's some things called globular clusters, dense balls of stars, where the temperature can be you know, hundreds of times hotter in the center of a globular cluster. And in the center of a galaxy, most galaxies have very massive black holes at their center. And they're just sucking up all the material near it and squeezing it in. And where all that material is being squeezed can get tremendously hot, but still not hot enough to really make gamma rays. So the point is, nothing in the universe makes gamma rays just because it's so hot. So you have to have different ways to make gamma rays. And basically, the way you make gamma rays is, is relatively simple. There's a few variants on it. But the idea is that you have to somehow or other accelerate a charged particle up to very high energies. The reason it has to be a charged particle is because you can use electric and magnetic fields to control the particle to accelerate it. So step one is you have some electric magnetic fields and you accelerate a charged particle up to very high energies. Step two is you crash it into something. The something could be a lot of different things. It could be an atom. It could be a particle. It could be a photon. It could be a magnetic field. But basically, you have to take a, high, a charged particle, accelerate it up, give it a lot of energy, run it into something. And when you do that, you get gamma rays. Now, in terms of astrophysical sources, if you know, we want to talk about how does this process actually happen out there in the universe. Well, what you need, and this is the only equation I have in, in the talk, um, what you need here is you need some sort of energy source that you're going to be dumping into the environment to accelerate these, these particles. And then you need a way to actually accelerate the particles. Um, this is the SLAC uh, linear accelerator. Um, in, in essence, what we're talking about is we're talking about cosmic versions of, of particle accelerators. And then you need something to run those particles into once they've been accelerated to make gamma rays. And the last thing you have to worry about is you have to worry about what is between us and the place where that happens. If you make a bunch of gamma rays at the core of a star, they won't actually make it out of the star and we won't see them. So you have to worry about what your foregrounds are. But once you have all of those things together, you can, you can see gamma rays. Now, the sort of energy sources that we're talking about, well, these are astrophysical energy sources. They're things like exploding stars, um, things like accretion. That's where the black hole in the center of the galaxy is pulling in a lot of material and squeezing it. And then uh, some of it is actually coming out in jets, because um, it's, 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 you're squeezing it so hard that some of it excuse me, comes spurting out. 
Or um, there are some objects that have extremely strong electric and magnetic fields. And uh, when those fields rotate, they can, they can generate um, you know, enough energy to make, to make gamma rays. Um, there's a lot of different ways to make gamma rays. I'm not going to go into all of this. I'm just going to say that all of these different ways to make gamma rays have different signatures in other wave bands. And so if you only had a gamma ray telescope, you might not be able to tell these different processes apart. But if you have a gamma ray telescope and you have a friend that has a radio telescope, well, some of these processes would make radio um, signatures and some of them wouldn't. So that really, again, underscores the, the need to have different kinds of astronomers uh, working together to study any, any one object. So um, at this point, I just want to say, to recap a little bit, um, Gamma rays really tell us about the most extreme, the most violent phenomenon out there in the universe because it's very difficult to make gamma rays. You know, your st stars won't make gamma rays. Even the hottest objects in the universe won't ga make gamma rays. Gamma rays tend to come from transient things like explosions or from like the, the accretion in the center of the galaxy. So the reason you want a gamma ray telescope is to be able to identify these sorts of objects and to study them. So now I'm going to talk about how you actually go about building a gamma ray telescope. So in order to do this, the first question really I have to ask is, how do we actually detect gamma rays? And um, to answer that question, I'm going I'm to give you a little bit of an aside. Um, what this slide here has is it has many different kinds of telescopes. Um, this is low energy radio, working your way around optical here, and then to high energy and energy gamma rays here. And the first thing I want to point out is these telescopes look really different from each other. And that's because you use different physical processes to detect different kinds of radiation. And um, so you, you, know, you can't just make the same telescope and make it smaller or bigger to detect different kinds of radiation. There's actually different physical processes. And because of that, the telescopes look very different because they're, they're fundamentally different from each other. And the second thing I want to point out is some of these telescopes are in space and some of them are on the ground. And that's because there's some wavelengths where the radiation can make it through the atmosphere and there's other wavelengths where it can't. Um, so talking about gamma rays specifically, um, the first point is that uh, lenses and mirrors don't do anything to gamma rays. They'll just happily go straight through them. So if you want to build a gamma ray telescope, you don't get a bunch of lenses and mirrors. Um, the way you actually detect gamma rays is um, using particle physics. And that's the reason I can be standing here in front of all of you, even though I've never taken an astronomy class in my life, because I studied particle physics. And um, the idea is that there's a very specific interaction called pair production, where a gamma ray, which you don't actually see, comes along. And what it does is it interacts with matter, and it makes a particle, uh, in this case an electron, but it has to conserve electrical charge. So it also makes an anti-electron, just like an electron, but with the opposite sign electrical charge. Now, the scientists that took this particular image um, put a magnetic field here. And the magnetic field bent the two particles, so they move away from each other. And so just looking at this image, you can see that a gamma ray came in from the left over here. It made this pair conversion. And then the electron and the positron pair moved along. And you can even sort of tell where the, where the gamma ray came from. And that's the principle of a gamma ray telescope. Um, the second point about pair production is pair production happens a lot. And the reason gamma rays don't make it through the atmosphere is because of pair production. A gamma ray will come in, you'll get some pair production, but then those electrons and the positrons will make more gamma rays. And you'll actually get a whole shower of electrons and positrons and gamma rays. And you basically lose all the information about where the original gamma ray came from. And so it's really hard to do astronomy here if you're, if you're, if you're sitting on the ground. So the solution to all of this is that you take a particle physics detector um, and you shoot it into space. And so to do that, um, we built the Fermi Observatory. There's actually two instruments on this observatory. This part here is a telescope. And this part down here, it's not quite a telescope. It's, um, it's a monitor. It's a burst monitor. Um, over here, we're actually going to be tracking the gamma rays. Down here, what we have is we have a lot of different sensors that are pointed in different directions. And what this part down here tries to do is it tries to capture very bright flashes. There's a phenomenon called gamma ray bursts, where you get a very bright flash of gamma rays that lasts sometimes less than a second, sometimes up to about 100 seconds. And so what happens is if you get a flash, say, over on this side, these monitors might detect it, but these ones won't. So you can say, oh, hey, there was a gamma ray burst somewhere over, over in this part of the sky. 
I'm going to say a lot more about the Large Area Telescope in, in just a minute. But the last point I wanted to make is it takes really big teams uh, to put together these sorts of instruments. Um, for the Large Area Telescope, uh, it's about a 400-person team from five countries, and a lot of the work was done, was done here at SLAC. Um, the whole sort of from design to building to being ready to launch was about a 10-year process. And about 10 years ago, we had everything ready. We shipped um, the, the observatory down to Florida and uh, put it on a rocket, and we launched it. And many of us actually watched the launch from the auditorium in the next building over. And uh, for those of us that had been working on this for some amount of time, I'd only been working on it for three years at that point, but there had been people who had been working on it 10 years or more. They were very nervous because uh, Obviously, you've just put this thing you've you know, invested 10 years of your life in on top of something that could turn into a bomb um, very quickly if, if things go awry. So the idea then is, and this is the first of many animations I have, um, what you, you have is you have this, this satellite here that has a telescope on top of it. And um, what's actually in the telescope, you know, this big cube that doesn't look very um, interesting, it's a stack of planes of silicon that can detect charged particles when they go through it. So what happens is a single gamma ray will come in, and it'll pair convert now. And then the electron and the positron will leave signals in the silicon as they go through. And what you do is you detect those signals, and then you, uh, you backtrace them. And you backtrace them all the way back up to where they join up, and you see what direction that incoming gamma ray came from. So really one gamma ray at a time, you do this. Now, a very important point here is that you're equally sensitive to particles coming in sideways or something like this. So unlike most telescopes where you're focusing the light, with a gamma ray telescope, you're actually seeing a huge part of the sky at any one time. Um, and so the way we operate Fermi is it goes around the Earth every 90 minutes or so. And we'll spend one orbit looking at the southern sky. And then we'll rock the telescope and we'll spend the next orbit looking at the northern sky. So every three hours, we actually get a picture of, of the entire sky. And this is, this is very, very important because so many phenomena that happen in gamma rays are transient phenomena. They're things like explosions and so forth. So it's great to monitor the whole sky. So once we do all of this, uh, you could ask what we actually see. So um, this is what we saw in the first minute of running Fermi. These are all of the gamma rays above one billion electron volts in energy. Um, there's three of them. There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. It's like a pointillist painting. Um, fortunately, we're collecting data all the time. So after one hour, you actually start to see, and this, remember, this is a picture of the whole sky. I haven't told you exactly what you're looking at, but this is the whole sky. You have a few hundred gamma rays scattered across the sky, and you can see that there's more in some parts than, than in other parts. Um, after a day, you really start to see, oh, yeah, there's... You know, there's a lot more gamma rays here, and then you start to see there's individual points. There's individual re regions that have a lot of gamma rays uh, coming from them. After a week, this is interesting, because at this point, we had collected about as many gamma rays as all previous gamma ray missions had collected. So at this point, we're sort of in uncharted territory. We're, we're looking at the sky in a, in a whole new way. Um, we keep taking data. After a month, you have this, this nice image. And after a year, you start to have a really, really beautiful image of, of the whole sky. And then you take data for several years, and you just have this amazing image of the whole sky. Now, what we're looking at, well, this is a particular projection of the sky where we've taken the Milky Way and we've put it along the equator. And all of the images that I'm going to show you from this point use, use the, same, the same projection. So the Milky Way is always living along the middle of the image. Um, and you can see that the Milky Way is brighter in gamma rays than other, other parts of the sky. Um, that's because many of the things that we see in gamma rays are, are in our own galaxy. So when we study the gamma ray sky, what we do is we break it apart into different, um, different pieces. Um, so the first piece is actually the emission from our galaxy, but not from individual things, just from all of the high energy particles that are zipping around our galaxy running into stuff. Remember, that's how you make gamma rays. So what this is doing is it's really tracing where high energy particles are interacting with all of the dust and gas and stuff in our galaxy. And so we get this, this beautiful image of basically the stuff in our, in our galaxy. The second part that we have is literally thousands of individual points of light. Um, you see that those points of light cover the whole sky, but there's sort of an excess of them in the, the plane of the galaxy. That's because many of them are in our own galaxy. But we're also looking at many, many things um, that are outside of our galaxy. In fact, we're looking at many other galaxies. 
And then the last thing that we see is sort of a, a background, a background haze, um, that is probably just things that are too dim to make out individually. But you know, there could also be some very, very exciting things uh, hiding in this, in this background. OK. So at that point, oh, so at this point, I think I've explained to you why we would want to do gamma ray astronomy. And I'm going to shift gears now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a, um, five different sort of scientific highlights, starting with some very nearby objects and moving to some very, very far away objects. Now, interestingly, and I really want to emphasize this point, is every single one of these highlights that I'm going to talk about, somebody has come up to me and said, this is the most exciting thing that Fermi is doing. And I think that really underscores the point that a, an observatory is a tool, and different people use that tool for, for very, very different purposes. Of course, I have my own opinions about what the most exciting thing is, but every one of these things got some people very excited. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is gamma rays actually coming from the Earth. And these gamma rays had to travel about a thousandth of a second to get to the Fermi Observatory. Um, and where they're coming from probably shouldn't be that much of a surprise if you think about it. You need really strong electric and magnetic fields to make gamma rays. So they're coming from thunderstorms. And uh, when you have a lightning strike, what happens is that accelerates a bunch of electrons up into the atmosphere. Um, and so you basically get this burst of electrons going up into the atmosphere. But every so often, some of those electrons will come near atoms, and they'll make gamma rays. And then those gamma rays might come near other atoms and make uh, an electron and a positron. And what you do is you get this whole electromagnetic shower process going on. So after a lightning strike, what you end up with is you end up with this burst of gamma rays going up into the sky. And then interestingly, the second thing that happens is all of those electrons and positrons that are part of that shower they all follow the Earth's magnetic field lines. And so a lot of times what happens is Fermi might be sitting here and it would see a blast of gamma rays coming from the Earth, coming from down, even though it's looking up. Um, but sometimes, and this was really a shock to everybody, sometimes what can happen is Fermi can be hundreds of miles away from where the lightning storm is, but those particles can travel along one of the Earth's magnetic field lines and hit Fermi. And so then we see this really sudden like blast of, of particles hitting Fermi. It lights up the whole instrument for like a, a hundredth of a second, um, even though we're nowhere, nowhere near an actual lightning storm. And it took us a while to figure out what was, what was, going, what was going on here. Um, so now I'm going to move a little bit further away, and I'm going to talk about gamma rays from the sun. These take about eight minutes to get to Fermi. And uh, the first point is that the sun doesn't actually give off a lot of gamma rays on your average day. It's, it's not a very bright source. It's kind of funny. We built this amazing telescope, and in fact, we can barely see the sun most days. Um, what I'm going to show you here is a picture of the whole northern hemisphere. It's actually a movie. And the first thing that you're going to notice is things are flickering. And that's because the gamma ray sky is very transient, very extreme. These explosions, things getting brighter, things getting dimmer, because there are all of these processes um, that are there, what we call non-thermal. You know, there are things like explosions, there are large energy um, uh, dumps, um, and so forth. And so when I play this movie, right away you see that the whole sky is flickering. But there's this one little source here that's, that's moving along. And so, you know, every six months this will sort of appear in the northern sky and move its way across the sky, and then it'll move into the southern sky. And, and that's the sun. And you can see that, you know, we can detect the sun, but it's by no stretch of the imagination the brightest thing in, in the gamma ray sky. Um, and again, that's because the sun by itself isn't hot enough to, to give off a lot of gamma rays. Now, there's an exception to this. When you get solar flares, when you get sunstorms, what happens is the sun's magnetic field can reconfigure itself really quickly, release a huge amount of energy, and actually give off a bunch of gamma rays. Oh, if you haven't figured it out yet, in all of these NASA animations, gamma rays are always magenta or pink. And um, when that happens, for you know, a few hours or a few minutes or a day even in, in the most extreme case, the sun actually is the brightest thing in the gamma ray sky. And it'll just flare up for a day and be tremendously bright and then, uh, and then fade away again. So really, the only time the sun is, is very bright is when it's undergoing this very strong solar, solar activity. Now, this is where we had another great surprise. And this surprise came in because we have colleagues that look at the sun in other wavelengths. And this is two images of the sun. But this is the near side of the sun. And this image is actually taken from a satellite that is observing the sun from the far side of the sun. And when we looked at the data from these two satellites, and we looked at the time around this gamma ray flare, what we noticed is that the actual event, the thing that actually caused the, the, the gamma rays, happened on the far side of the sun. 
So the question was, how are we actually even able to observe these, these gamma rays at all? And so what we think happened is we think that that event released a bunch of particles um, into the sun's magnetic field. And then those particles, what they did is they followed the sun's magnetic field lines around to the near side of the sun, ran into the surface of the sun, and produced gamma rays there. And so that's how we're actually able to, to observe that particular phenomenon. OK. Now I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to start talking about things that are a little bit less uh, familiar and, and a lot, lot further away. Um, excuse me. Uh, so you remember that when I showed you the map of all the points of light, all the sources in the galaxy, or all the sources in the sky, there was an excess of them in the galaxy. There's a lot of things in our own galaxy that make gamma rays. And what most of those are is they're objects called pulsars. And what a pulsar is, is it's a leftover star remnant uh, called a neutron star. When the star burns out, it loses the energy to support itself and it collapses. But it keeps most of its mass. And what happens is that that object uh, ends up being about the mass of the sun, but only about 10 kilometers across. So basically the size of the city of San Francisco. And as it collapses, it keeps its rotational momentum. But as it's getting s smaller and smaller, like a, like a figure skater, when they pull in their arms, it speeds up. And so you have these objects that they can rotate once a second or even faster. So imagine something that weighs as much as the sun, but it's the size of the city of San Francisco, and it's rotating around every second. This makes tremendously powerful electric and magnetic fields, and those fields can accelerate particles. And so this is sort of our, our idea of what a pulsar looked like when we started um, the, Fermi, the Fermi mission. It's spinning around, and every so often as it spins, it's like a lighthouse effect. Every so often it points towards us. And every time it points towards us, we get a flash of light. And that's why it's called a pulsar, because it's, it's pulsing. And so you know, the, the flash of light is related to how quickly it's spinning. Now, this is the image that we had when we started the Fermi mission. And it turns out that it's actually wrong in, in a few subtle ways. And uh, after a few years of Fermi, we changed the image to look like this. And what's going on here is this is a beam of radio, um, radio waves that's pulsing. And these are the gamma rays. And you see that they're coming from different parts of the pulsar. And the reason we know this is a better model is because when we compare the gamma ray data to the, to the radio data, they don't always agree. You have some pulsars that are very bright in radio, but they're not very bright in, in gamma rays. And so that means that you know, sometimes you're seeing the gamma ray beam, but not the radio beam. So the two beams can't be pointing in, in the same direction. And so this means that studying gamma rays in radio and in uh, studying pulsars in radio and in gamma rays really teaches you much more about the, 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 uh, the entire object. And so what's happened is that um, we've actually started to collect a lot of pulsars with Fermi. This is an artist's visualization of the whole galaxy. This is the center of the galaxy here, about 25,000 uh, light years away. We live over here. And these are places where we've seen pulsars. And at this point, we can see pulsars out to about 10,000 um, light years away, so about a third of the way towards the center of the galaxy. So we've sort of discovered most of the pulsars in our local neighborhood. Um, in radio, we know about a couple thousand pulsars. In gamma rays now, we know about a few hundred. And so we're really making a census of pulsars and, and studying them as, as, a class, uh, as a class of object. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the next phenomenon which is still our own galaxy, but it's not an individual thing in the galaxy. It's actually um, sort of the galaxy itself. So this is another sort of all-sky image of Fermi. Here's the, the plane. Um, in this case, the yellow colors is just means brighter. The blue colors means, means dimmer, means, means fewer gamma rays. Now remember, we know that gamma rays are coming from high energy particles running into the dust and the gas in the galaxy. And we have colleagues with other kinds of telescopes who can tell us where the dust and the gas are. So what that means is that we can model what we should see in gamma rays. And when we do this, we find something very interesting. So the first part of this animation is just basically trying to visualize the modeling process where you know, we treat the data in different ways. We take out the sources. And then what we do is we get rid of the emission that we expect to see in gamma rays. Um, and what happens then is we have these, these leftovers, these very, very bright things where we're seeing more gamma rays than what we expect. And this, again, came as a surprise because these, these regions are they're very structured. You can see these, these big areas here where we're just seeing way more gamma rays than, than what we actually expect. Now, remember, 
in order to um, make gamma rays, you need to have high energy particles and they need to run into something. And so, you know, this is a sort of artist's visualization of the galaxy. And it basically means we've got these bubbles here going above and below the center of the galaxy that are filled up with high energy particles. Now, since they're sort of pointing towards the center of the galaxy, um, that's, that's really, really interesting because somehow or other, all of these high energy particles had to get there. And remember I said earlier that most galaxies have a very massive black hole at the center of the galaxy. So this is sort of an image of our galaxy as you look at it, you know, looking along the disk. And what this is telling us is in all likelihood, the black hole at the center of our galaxy has been spitting out these high energy particles and filling up these bubbles with these high energy particles over the last million years at least. Um, again, this was a big surprise to everybody involved and really another example of what you learn when you look at the sky in, in a new way. Um, okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take another step back, in fact a very, very large step now, and I'm going to talk about gamma rays that aren't coming from our galaxy but are actually coming from other galaxies. And some of these gamma rays are coming from incredibly far away. Um, some of the furthest objects that we can see with Fermi are around 12 billion light years away. Uh, we believe the universe is about 13 and a half billion years old. So these gamma rays have been traveling to us for most of the age of the universe. Um, and if you think about it, in order for something to be visible that far away, it has to be tremendously bright. Um, and there's a, there's a class of object. Um, it's, a, it's a galaxy that's, that's young, that's forming. And as the galaxy is forming, again, you have this disk of, this disk of dust and, this, and gas, and you have a massive black hole in the center of it. And the black hole is trying to pull everything in, but not everything it gets, you know, you, you squeeze stuff from one direction, it'll come spurting out in, the, in other directions. And so what you end up with is you end up with these incredibly powerful beams of particles that are coming out the poles of these galaxies. And every so often, one of those beams is pointed right at us. And then it's like a laser. You know, if you're in exactly the right direction, this thing is tremendously bright. But if you're a little bit away from that right direction, you, you just don't see it very much. So out there, there's a few thousand of these, these, these active galaxies called blazars where the beam is pointed right at us. And they, we can see them um, incredibly far away. And they're very, very bright in gamma rays um, because many gamma rays are actually made in these beams as it, as it comes towards us. Now we can do something really incredible with these blazars, which is we can measure how much starlight there is in the universe. And the reason we can do that is because of this pair production process. So when these blazars, they have these beams of light and they make tons of gamma rays and these gamma rays are coming towards us. But remember, some of these blazars are 12 billion years away. So these gamma rays have to travel 12 billion years across the, across the universe to get to us. And there's a little bit of starlight in the universe, just from all the stars that have ever shined. And what will happen is every so often, as one of these gamma rays is trying to come to us, it'll run into some starlight, it'll make pair production, and that gamma ray will never reach us. And so what this means is that as you go to more and more different distant objects, um, also this process tends to happen more to higher energy gamma rays. So as you go to more and more distant objects, um, it becomes harder and harder to see the highest energy gamma rays from those objects because they get absorbed by, by the starlight along the way. So what you can do is you can do a study where you compare nearby blazars, nearby active galaxies, to, to ones that are further away. And for the relatively nearby ones, you see that um, you know, the spectrum, it, it, it drops off a little bit at the highest energies here. That's what this point is. Relative to the expectation, it's, it's a little bit lower. But then as you move and you study further away blazars, you see that this, this change happens at, at somewhat lower energies. And then when you look at the very furthest blazars, you see that you're losing most of the high energy gamma rays relative to what's happening for the nearby ones. And most importantly, when you actually take the data in and you compare it to the models, it agrees almost perfectly with the model where this effect is because of the starlight. And it doesn't agree with this, this um, black line, which is a model where this is just intrinsic differences in, in the galaxies. So really what we're doing here is we're measuring the amount of starlight that, um, that there is in the universe as a whole. And what that allows you to do is to come up with this amazing number, which is our estimate is that there's about 1.4 stars per 100 billion cubic light years. Um, now, most of the stars clump together in galaxies, so you don't have to go a billion light years to see the next star. But that's, that's just a, a very, very interesting number there. Okay.
Now, up to this point, what I've been talking about is things that we see with gamma rays and things that we learn about these objects with other kinds of telescopes. The last two things I'm going to talk about are slightly different. These are two examples of where, rather than learning about um, the sky by comparing gamma rays to other kinds of telescopes, we're learning about the universe by comparing gamma rays to completely new kinds of detectors. Um, the first is gravity wave detectors. So in the past year, uh, two actually, a bunch of gravity wave detectors have come online. These are detectors that can detect the little vibrations um, in space caused by massive objects moving around. Um, and I think some of you probably came to some of the talks about gravity wave detection. It's been in the news recently. But the idea is that you have um, two very massive objects. These are neutron stars, things like pulsars, that are spinning around each other. And in this animation, you can see that the, um, the background, there are these waves that are, being, that are being shaped in the background. That's the artist's conception of gravity waves. And in the last couple of years, we've actually gotten to the point where we can detect these. Most interestingly, um, with one of these gravity wave detections, we saw one of these little gamma ray flashes, you know, a two second burst of gamma rays. We didn't see it with the main instrument on Fermi, we saw it with the burst monitor, but it was perfectly correlated in time. And so what that does is it helps explain where these gamma ray flashes, where these gamma ray bursts have been coming from, because it's correlated with the signal that we see in these gravity wave detectors. And the signal we see in the gravity detectors, we know it's coming from these, these systems, these binary systems of stars coalescing and, and merging. So now we can explain at least some of what these gamma ray um, bursts are because of the gravity wave detector. Now, since this is an electromagnetic radiation, I don't think you can really think of it as another color. It's more like another sense. Like the gravity wave detector is listening to the universe instead of seeing the universe in, in a new color. But again, it's, it's a new way to learn uh, about the universe. And then the last thing I want to talk about is something that was actually in the news just a couple weeks ago, which is uh, detecting, doing astronomy with an entirely new kind of particle. Um, there's a particle called a neutrino that is similar to light, it's similar to a photon, except that it barely, barely interacts. A single neutrino can go through miles and miles and miles of material before, actually almost light years of material before it, it's likely to even interact. But we believe that neutrinos are created in much the same way as gamma rays. So if you have something like an active galaxy, like a blazar that's making a bunch of gamma rays, we believe it should also be making a bunch of neutrinos. So in this, in this visualization here, the neutrinos are these little white, white particles. But it's very hard to actually observe the neutrinos. Um, and in order to detect the neutrinos, uh, the way they've done this is they've built a detector at the South Pole, and they've actually used the polar ice as the sensitive material. So what will happen is a neutrino can come in, and one neutrino out of a trillion will interact with something in the ice, and it'll make a particle, and as that particle goes through the ice, it gives off light. And what they've done is they've put a bunch of photosensitive detectors deep in the ice, and by looking at the light as that particle moves through, they can backtrace where the neutrino came from. And so there was a big announcement a couple weeks ago, because at this point they've only detected a handful of neutrinos that they're pretty sure are coming from space. And one of those neutrinos um, had something, a very, very interesting property about it, which that it happened to point back very, very close to a blazar that Fermi sees. And not only did it point back to the blazar that Fermi sees, it pointed back to the blazar during a period when the blazar was particularly bright. So there was some process that was making the blazar brighter, that was actually making it give off more high energy gamma rays. And during that time, we saw one neutrino from, from this blazar. So that's really confirming our idea that the same processes that can make the gamma rays can, can actually uh, make the neutrinos. So what all of that means is that this sort of traditional view of how you do astrophysics, where you basically, your tools are photons that are coming to you and studying the atoms and the electrons and the protons that, that, that make up the sources, this has really changed because now you have new tools, you have neutrinos, you have gravity waves. You basically have new senses that you can um, explore, explore the universe with. So on that note, I'm going to uh, summarize my talk. Um, so I guess the first point is that the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope has turned 10, um, and it's really dramatically changed the way we understand extreme phenomenon. I gave you five examples of different kinds of sources that, that can make gamma rays because they're very extreme phenomenon. And in each case, I, I told you about some surprise that we had when we, when we studied um, that source and, and the phenomenon that produces the, the gamma rays.
Um, the second point that I want to reiterate is telescopes are used for different things by different people. Um, one question I get a lot is, what do you do with your, what's your telescope good for? And you know, the answer is, well, that depends on who you're asking. And here I hope I've illustrated that you know, different people get excited about you know, studying gamma rays from the sun, or studying gamma rays from pulsars, or studying gamma rays from distant galaxies. Um, and then the last point is that a lot of the most exciting science that we would get with something like Fermi comes when we combine the data with uh, data from our colleagues that have other kinds of telescopes. And I think that's a really key point, um, because I think it's very common in modern science. A lot of the great discoveries we're making nowadays come when you put together pieces from very, very disparate places. Um, I think if things were easy, we probably would have already done them. So that's why it takes these big teams in order to be able to, um, you know, to do this sort of science, because you know, it's hard to build a gamma ray telescope, but the gamma ray telescope becomes much more valuable if you also have colleagues that have a radio telescope, if you also have colleagues that have an optical telescope, um, and so forth. So I think at that point, I'll stop and uh, take questions. Okay, so Eric, thank you very much. Um, We'll, uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. You have in front of you a microphone, so you push the red button in the middle after you're recognized, and you can speak into the microphone. Only one person can hold the floor at a time, so uh, um, anyway, who would like to begin? Please. Yes, they are. Um, did everybody hear the question? So um, oftentimes when people talk about gamma rays, uh, they're talking about uh, things coming from radioactive decays. That's those typically, the typical energies you're talking about there is one million electron volts. Um, and I'm, the gamma rays you see with Fermi are more typically one billion electron volts. So a thousand times more, um, more energetic. And for a variety of technical reasons, um, it's very hard to do astronomy with the gamma rays around one million electron volts. Um, whereas the ones with one billion, you can actually build a telescope like Fermi to, to observe them. Please. You, you have mentioned these very, very, very high temperatures. Could you say something about uh, what sort of thermometer you use or uh, uh, apparatus to arrive at these numbers? Uh, well, basically, you look at the spectrum of the object. Um, in an ideal scenario, um, the, the color that an object glows is directly related to its temperature. Now, that's never quite true because um, you know, there's, there's atoms in there that'll absorb some of the light and re-emit some of the light. Um, but there's this concept of what's called a black body, which is basically an ideal glowy thing. And if you have a black body, if you have this ideal glowy thing, the spectrum of the light that gives off is dictated only by the temperature of the object. And so if you can see the, the, the spectrum of light from something, um, you can basically make a pretty good estimate of, of what the temperature is, assuming that that thing is giving off light because it's hot, because it's glowing. Um, if it's giving off gamma rays, those are different processes. That's not just because it's hot, it's because you have electric fields and so forth. But for things like stars, most of the light that you get from stars is just because they're so hot and because they're glowing. And so then you can make a pretty accurate estimate of what the surface temperature of the star is. Push the button, it'll turn red. Can you hear me now? I'll speak, I'll speak loud. Uh, um, no, 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 because it's recorded. Here's the one next to you. OK, thank you. I'm going to push it twice. So go off. OK. Um, so you've talked about uh, gamma rays from five different sources, and you had a diagram that um, uh, you know, showed the different backgrounds. How are you actually able to determine what source a gamma ray or a uh, group of gamma rays comes from? So for any one gamma ray, you can't know for sure. Um, what happens is there's a gamma ray that happens to come really close to a cluster of a bunch of other gamma rays. Um, now, that might be from the same thing as everything else in the cluster, or it might not. 
For any one gamma ray, you, you just can't know for sure. But the thing that you do know is that you saw a cluster of gamma rays. You saw a bunch of gamma rays coming from very close to the same direction. So then you say, well, there's something there. And these gamma rays have a much higher probability of being from that source than they do from you know, some background because you know, there's 50 gamma rays from this one direction in the sky and only two or three on average um, from, from other directions. So, so that, that's how you do it. Well, maybe there's, there's more to say about that. First of all, you have to actually read your astrophysics books or take the course. Um, many of these sources are actually identified uh, by optical telescopes or by radio telescopes. So then you know from the shape of it, what kind of thing is it? Is it an active galaxy, uh, for example? The other thing is that the pulsars that uh, Eric described actually pulse. They come regularly, once a second or once every 10 milliseconds, with a pulse of gamma rays. And then you can tell from that um, that it's that kind of object. And so you put together all of this information. And again, not just from the gamma rays, but from all the bands. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. The, um, there's a lot of work uh, in terms of identifying. You know, you see a little cluster of things in gamma rays, but then um, we call that association, multi-wavelength association, figuring out what the thing actually is, what it corresponds to from the optical data set, from the radio data set, and, and so forth. Okay. Way in the back there. Um, what, was, what was the biggest engineering challenge for the telescope? So the, um, <laughs> the issue is, it's actually very interesting. Um, the issue is that it's really hard to get rid of heat in space. And what that means is that all the electronics that you have, they all generate heat. And to dump that heat is actually pretty tricky. Um, the solar panels can provide you with a fair amount of energy, but you then have to get rid of that heat somehow. And what that does is that puts a really tight constraint on basically how much electronics you can run on the instrument. And these silicon um, detectors that detect very precisely where the charged particles go, um, there's literally hundreds of thousands of individual strips. They're very, very finely grained strips, and each one of those strips you have to be able to read out individually. And so you have these hundreds of thousands of channels, and each one of them is going to take a little bit of, of energy to run. And so coming up with a scheme where you can have this really finely segmented detector, and you can run it on 850 watts, which is less than a toaster oven, um, that was probably the, the sort of the limiting factor, the, the single limiting factor. But anytime you go to space, you're just balancing out so many things. You also have to be able to fit it inside the, the, the rocket that you're going to launch it to. And you have to figure out how to get the data to the ground. And you're really just playing this game of, of, of trade-offs. Uh, in the back there. Um, uh, isn't space really cold, so wouldn't it be easy to dispose of the heat? No, no, it depends on where you are. If you're near the Earth, space is about the same temperature as the Earth. And it also depends on, on what you're looking at. Um, you know, if you're facing towards the sun, you're getting a lot of sunlight, and so it's actually very hard to dispose of heat. Um, or, alternatively, if you're looking down at the Earth, then you're seeing this thing that's, that's shining at about, um, you know, the sort of temperature that, that we're at now. And um, so it's relatively hard to dispose of heat. So what you need is you need these, these things called radiators that, that shine, that glow a little bit, but they need to be pointed away from the sun and away from the Earth. So there's not that much of the sky where you can actually get that. So when Fermi is going around and doing its orbit, it's always doing this complicated sort of maneuver because you have a lot of constraints. You have to keep the solar panels pointed at the sun, but you also have to keep the radiators pointed away from the sun and away from the Earth. And then you want to be looking at the sky so that you can actually do astronomy. So um, Fermi's just always sort of doing this, this complicated twisting, turning thing as, it, as it's going around. That's a good question, by the way. Um, sir. Got it? Yeah. Oh, I just, just did the, uh, what's the energy resolution of the telescope system, and what information do you get out of the energy distributions that you're able to obtain as opposed to just the directionality? In most, so the energy resolution, an, an individual gamma ray, um, actually that, that animation I had just showed you how you backtrace the gamma ray. Below those sensors, there's another sensor that absorbs all of the energy of the gamma ray and measures that energy. 
Um, that's accurate to uh, basically 10%. It depends a little bit on the energy. The highest energy gamma rays, a lot of it um, actually goes out the back, and so your, your performance degrades. But 10% is a reasonable number. But the point is that all of these processes that we're talking about um, that make uh, gamma rays, they're things that you're looking at the very, very highest energy particles. Um, you know, you accelerate a whole bunch of particles in some you know crazy, chaotic, random magnetic field, and and you get a whole spectrum of them. And only the highest energy ones are actually in the, in the gamma ray range. And so almost all the spectra that we look at in gamma rays fall very sharply with energy. Um, usually it's somewhere even more than every time you go up by a factor of two in energy, you go down by a factor of four or more in terms of the number of particles that, that you're seeing. So if you go from 1 billion electron volts to 10 billion electron volts, you actually have 100 times fewer, fewer particles. So most of the things that we're seeing are falling off very sharply with energy. Now, um, pulsars fall off less sharply with energy at lower energies than some of the other things do, and then they fall off much more sharply at higher energies. So you can, in fact, um, even if you don't see the pulsations, a lot of times you can distinguish pulsars um, from, from other kinds of sources. In fact, uh, my postdoc, Matia, has done a tremendous amount of work uh, along those, those lines. Um, but in general, um, unless a source is very bright and you can really, really study it well, it's hard to get that much information out of, out of the um, energy resolution. There's a couple exceptions to that. You can ask me about those uh, afterwards, but that's, that's kind of, I'd say, the, the rule of thumb. What's the future for the Fermi telescope and for uh, gamma ray astronomy? <laughs> well, those are very different questions. Um, so Fermi has been up for 10 years. And um, I think the best indicator, it, it's run by NASA. NASA gets to, to make the decisions. Now, there are no consumables on Fermi. There's nothing that's going to run out. But there are things that will break eventually. Um, it's in a very high orbit. It could stay up there for something like 50 years if we just let it be. But probably things would break before then. But there's no replacement. And there's no replacement on the horizon. And NASA has a tendency not to end missions when they're still running at more or less their full capacity and there's no replacement. Because if you do that, you lose that window on the universe. Um, and particularly, the last two things that I talked about, those are very new development. Uh, the idea of gravity waves, um, being able to detect them, and neutrinos. And in both cases, there's a strong connection with gamma rays. Um, so by having Fermi up there and being able to tell us about the gamma rays that are coming from these new sorts of sources that we're only really exploring now, it really adds to the, the scientific value of, of, of having Fermi up there. So, I mean, I'm not NASA, I can't promise anything, but my assumption would be that what they're going to do is they're going to try and run it for as long as possible, and they just reduce the costs. You know, they say, look, you guys have been doing this for 10 years, automate everything that you can, you know, you should be able to run this project on 25% of your time instead of 100% of the time you, the way you were back at the beginning. And as long as you can keep reducing the costs, they generally find a way to keep things running. Let's take two more questions. There was one over here. Um, please. My question is, how do you determine the distance of the source of the um, gamma rays? Well, you don't use the gamma rays to do it. Um, what you do is you, this is another case where you, um, you generally need data from other wavelengths. Um, for far away sources, what you do is you go to your optical astronomer friends, and they take a very detailed spectrum of the source. And what they do is they look for the amount that very characteristic lines of the source have been changed because of the Doppler effect. Um, they're all... They're redshifted because as the universe expands, things that are further away from us are moving away from us more, more quickly. And some of these sources are so far away from us that the redshift can be huge. They can be actually, instead of just being a tiny shift, the thing can actually be shifted by 100% or more. So these things are moving away from us at a very large fraction of, of the speed of the light, some of the, some of the most distant of, the, of these sources. So that's why you do far away sources. For nearby sources, um, like in our own galaxy, the redshifts don't apply. But in that case, oftentimes you have astronomical data 
that actually can tell you how far away the source is from parallax, for example. Last question, anyone? Yeah, uh, the WMAP satellite that showed us the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, the telescope that you were talking about, the gamma ray uh, space telescope, does it, uh, does it have any image like that? Or could you tell us about the condition uh, of, uh, during the inflationary period, how was it uh, with the gamma ray? Like, <laughs> Okay, that's, a, that's three, three different uh, questions. So, um, so what WMAP, just for, for members of the audience, did, what it, what it did, did is it um, took a beautiful, beautiful image of uh, basically a snapshot of a very early period of the universe um, by looking at a particular kind of, of radiation. Now, Fermi doesn't have any equivalent to that. Um, and the reason it doesn't have any equivalent to that is because as the universe expands, um, the, the radiation gets stretched out and it moves to lower and lower energies. And so in order to make um, you know, gamma rays, you need a, a tremendous amount of energy. And then you know, as the universe expands and expands, that energy would be stretched out and out and out. So if there were some sort of background that you could see with Fermi, it would be from you know, a, a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. But the point is, is that so many things happened between now and then that this foreground absorption issue comes in. That the gamma rays that you made then, they just, they did way too many things to ever actually make it to us. So sure, you were producing a bunch of gamma rays right at the beginning of the universe, but none of those gamma rays make it to us because the universe was so dense then, they just run into stuff right away. Um, and the, the, the WMAP um, thing is, it's a very precise snapshot of a point when, um, for, for regular light, that, that ceased to be true and all of a sudden the light could escape. And that, that's why you can do that sort of thing. And you just can't, unfortunately. I mean, you would learn so much if you could, but unfortunately you can't do that sort of thing in gamma rays because of the fact that the gamma rays actually need to be able to get to us. Okay. So uh, let's thank Eric once again. Um, so uh, if you would now uh, go out into the foyer, Eric will be out there in just a moment if you'd like to ask him questions privately. Also, you'll see other members of the Fermi team out there whom you might want to ask questions about the Fermi satellite. We'll see you again at the end of September when we will have a talk about a, a completely different subject, um, cryo-electron microscopy and how you use um, actually electrons, not radiation, to look inside of cells. So we'll see you then. Thank you very much.